أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. What we're going to do in Charlotte in the next couple of days is, well, today we're going to talk about the co context around the life of the Prophet, and we're going to, uh, inshallah, depending on how much time we have, either talk about you know, kind of what's called historical critical issues around the life of the Prophet, or we'll talk about the criticism, depending on how much time we have. Um, but the, the readings are really kind of there for your uh, background. We're not going to spend, you know, some of the readings we'll, we'll, we'll look at, but we're not going to, you know, the readings are kind of, they're there for you to have the background for our discussions. Our discussions will be about other issues. Uh, particularly, I think, you know, we could sort of sit around and talk about the life of the prophet for a couple of days, which would be very interesting. But, um, Considering the climate that uh, we're in regarding issues about Islam and Muslims, I think that it's much more useful <coughs> to focus on particular issues in the life of the Prophet and then kind of see how we build on those and deal with issues of controversy and that, are, that are put in our face all the time as Muslims or as people who are interested in religion or interested in, in uh, how, to, how we think about truth and morality um, across time. So uh, we'll talk about things like blasphemy, we'll talk about notions of authority, we'll talk about uh, how you deal with uh, how the prophet dealt with um, religious difference and building bridges across communities, and we'll talk about uh, slavery. Which I don't condone. Which I don't condone, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, and uh, so, so uh, that's what we focus on these issues, and not so much just like, and then on this year the prophet did this, and then this year the prophet did this, and then that happened. Okay. But first, let's look at. I still don't feel like there's. You know, this is not. A, uh, what is this? Is not doing justice to these pictures. Let's dim the lights. Dim the light. Look, who cares about the recording? <laughs> they can, my voice is even, the pictures are the important thing, not my. Uh, yeah, that was yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's the way to go. That's the way to do it, man. Way to go. Okay, does anyone know what this is? Yeah. Hagia Sophia. This is an Hagia Sophia. So the Ottomans, mashallah, not a destructive people, decided. Instead of destroying these mosaics, let's just plaster over the mosaic. So that's what they did, and of course, some of them have been uh, uncovered since uh, 1924. And uh, this is one of uh, Mary and Jesus. Uh, I'm not sure what. There's lots of different images of Jesus, different kind of stylistic images. Uh, this is a. I'm not sure. This is Jesus as a child. And then there's like the image of Christ Pantocrator, which I love that word. Is like the universal king. But this is, you can see, kind of standard. Uh, Mary, uh, I think it's Theotokos. Mary, the the mother, like the carrier of God, the mother, the person who's bearing God as a child. Okay, from Hagia Sophia. And the reason I bring this up is because, uh, in order to, in order to understand the life of the prophet you have to understand the late antique period. Late antiquity is, it's a, uh, well, you know, a, bit, a bit of history about this, this periodization. Um, until really the 1960s and 70s, um, the study of the, the, the kind of the study of the ancient world and Islam were very, were completely different sub uh, areas. So, you know, people would study Greco, you know, the classics, classic, classics of ancient Greece and Rome, and they would study, you know, from the time, you know, the uh, uh, ancient Greece of Homer, uh, to classical Greece of Aristotle and uh, uh, Aristophanes and Plato, 
and, and Themistocles, and then they would go up to the Roman period and to the end of the, you know, the Roman Revolution from around 100 BC to around the time of the uh, birth of Christ when Rome goes from the Republic to quote unquote empire. And uh, then they would study the, the kind of the period of uh, Augustan peace, the period of Antonine Rome in the 100s to the early 200s of the uh, Common Era. And, uh, you know, then they would uh, have interest in the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. If you're ever interested in a really great read that'll take you about 10 years, depending <laughs> on your, you know, it's good bedtime reading. It'll really improve your vocabulary. And you'll learn a lot. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, who died in 1794. Three volumes. It's one of the most fa fascinating and sort of foundational works of modern history. And a lot of, when you read it, you sort of see the, uh, not only the, the way in which the, the subject that this historian is studying, name of, the, name of the Roman Empire, how it influences him as a writer. How he is sort of a, trying to revive and is almost channeling the great Roman historians like Tacitus uh, and Ammianus Marcellinus. But then how that also informs the way historians write today. And what you see is, and this is actually very informative, that historians are deeply influenced by what they write about. And that's important to keep in mind. Historians are not, they don't stand outside of history. They are very much part of history. Anyway, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbons. Fascinating book. It'll take you a couple of years to read, unless you're sort of goodwill hunting smart, uh, in which case you should be teaching this class, not me. But uh, so ba basically, but then is Islam was another issue. Islam was studied, uh, I, I mentioned this in my, in my book on Hadith, which I, you've all read, but the study of Islam in the West comes out of three channels. Um, sorry, people sending me messages of con grievance. Um, the, the first the study of Islam in the West comes through three channels, okay? Uh, one is, uh, two, two are, are, are deeply colonial, okay? So one is the, when the British basically begin to exercise actual administrative and military control in India in the 1750s, after the Battle of Plessy in 1757, uh, they actually become administrators of several provinces of the Mughal Empire. And by this is fascinating, they actually are in charge of running Sharia courts in uh, the Mughal Empire. So you have something fascinating that arises called Anglo-Mohammedan law. If you're ever interested in this, it's fascinating. We can talk about it. But one of the things they, they actually, the, the, the official language of British administration in India until the early to mid 1800s was Persian. And British judges had to preside over Sharia courts and administer Sharia. So they had to basically start understanding these people that they were governing. They had to understand their law, <coughs> they had to understand their, their literature, they had to understand their history. And so uh, some of the, the beginning of the study of South Asian religion, Islam in South Asia, South Asian languages, Sanskrit, Persian, this comes through the efforts of British administrators in the late 1700s. Uh, one of the director generals of the uh, East India Company was Warren Hastings. Another person, his last name was Jones. I forget his first name. These are the, in addition to being administrators, they were also often scholars who pioneered the Western study of South, language and linguistics and, and, and religion in South Asia. So you have, uh, this is sort of matched by French study of Islam and Muslim culture, sort of the ways of the natives of Muslims in North Africa. Because this was from 1830 onwards, uh, Algeria was uh, invaded and occupied by the French. And in fact, it, became, it was considered to be part of France. It was actually just a, a province of France. And by the way, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of European uh, settlers settler colonialists came from France and other European countries uh, to uh, settle in Algeria. 
of course, displacing and killing uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Algerians in the local population. So for the, the French engage in the study of Islam and Muslims for the same exact reason. Who are these people we're governing? What are their traditions? How do they think about law? The second venue is diplomatics. And this is especially uh, the case in the, from roughly the uh, 1830s through the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, when Western countries like Europe, uh, Belgium, uh, Britain, uh, Germany, are increasingly involved with the Ottoman Empire at a diplomatic level, and needed to have people who understood Ottoman politics, um, understood the internal geographical uh, sort of forces of the Ottoman Empire and the political forces that they shaped. So that's the second route. The third route is really uh, an extension of essentially biblical studies. So we have to remember that until roughly the mid-1800s, Western universities, universities like Oxford, founded in the mid-1200s, Cambridge just a few decades later, the Sorbonne, mid-1200s, uh, yeah, Western universities were seminaries in the sense that, I mean, they weren't literally called seminaries, but the study, the study of anything, scholarship was religious scholarship. There wasn't secular scholarship and religious scholarship. You went to, you, if you went to university, Oxford University in 1290, or 1390, or 1490, or 1590, you were going to learn to study the Bible. You were going to learn to study Christian theology. You were going to learn the tools you needed to do that. So you're going to learn Latin grammar, Latin rhetoric, and uh, the basics of logic, of basically Aristotelian logic. And along with that, that was called the trivium. Along with that, you might also have moral philosophy. And then you'd have the quadrivium, the four other subjects, music, astronomy, mathematics, and uh, I think ge geometry is the fourth one, if I'm not mistaken. You can just look up the quadrivium. It's easy. So this was studying the rhetoric of Cicero, studying the logic of uh, the translation Boethius's translation of Porphyry's uh, Isagoge, the introduction to Aristotle's categories. Uh, this was how you learned basic logic, how to write, how to, how to, how to use rhetorical language in, la in Latin. Beginning in, the t beginning in the 1200s, in just a little bit, you started having also the study of Greek in Western universities, and that really didn't pick up until the 1400s. My point being is that the biblical studies was the old, that was studies. Right? There wasn't a theology department. There was everything was added on to that later on. Now, what happens in beginning in the Renaissance is the what could be eventually led to the historical critical study of the Bible. The idea that you're going to go back and try and reconstitute the original form of a biblical text, that you're going to think about it in its own environment, what was the purposes it served, uh, that you think about it more as a product of its own time than as an expression of universal truth. Universal truth by the 1700s came to be seen as something that the mind and philosophers could attain, and that the Bible was an expression of truth, but it didn't contain all of truth. Truth sort of lay outside it. Uh, part of this process, and part of what led to kind of the, in effect, marginalization of the biblical text in the greater search for truth, is that uh, by going back and finding early manuscripts of the biblical of the New Testament, the Old Testament, and seeing how the Old Testament changed over time, seeing how the New Testament uh, was formed, and discovering new non-canonical gospels and things. Like that. Part of what uh, emerged by the late 1700s was a notion that uh, 
very, very important, what becomes a very important crucial assumption in the Western study of religion period, which is that religions are not born fully formed. Uh, scripture isn't born intact. Scripture is built up over time, it's shaped, it's doctored, it's altered, parts are hidden, parts are taken out, things are added. And the theology or the, the, the dogma of a religion is also built over time and that the orthodoxy isn't the original version, the orthodoxy is a later kind of, in effect, a conspiracy that hides and shuts away the, early, the earlier heterodox elements. So this is, and you can see this as early as the writings of Voltaire, for example, who died 1778. This idea that there's all these early Christian writings which don't share the orthodox positions of the Catholic Church, or the, the Christian Church after the, the, the 300s of the Common Era. So, um, this is sort of part of the, leads to the gradual secularization of European scholarship and European thinking about truth because the Bible ceases to be an intact vehicle, vessel of truth, and starts to become a historical product that is, that is primarily meaningful in its own time and can only be mined for meaning later on because it corroborates things that we know to be meaningful in our, from reason. So Jesus, for example, stops to be, by the time you get to the early 1800s, the mid-1800s, in the universities of Germany and France and England, Jesus is no longer important because he's a fact. He's a, uh, how did that happen? Okay. Um, Jesus no longer sees, is no longer important because of the details of Jesus' life, because he said this or he did that. He's important because he teaches us the moral lesson of love, of forgiveness, of humility. It's the Christ of spirit, not the Christ of history that matters. So there's a long way to get to the point where, uh, which is the, the original point I was making, which is that what happens in the, by the late 1700s, and especially in the mid-1800s, is that European scholars, especially in the universities of Germany, the great universities of Germany like Tübingen, um, Heidelberg, that uh, are reformed and strengthened by the, what's called the, hum the reforms of Alexander von Humboldt in the, the mid to late 1800s, <coughs> they simply assume that they've, they've studied the, West, the biblical tradition and now you know, let's go and study other traditions. And they assume that other traditions function in exactly the same way. And if you, there's a fascinating, uh, there's a, the, the, the records of this um, uh, conference of Western scholars, Orientalists, in the early 1900s. And this German scholar gets up and says, we have now brought in lights to the forests of India and to the jungles of Africa. So, the colonial endeavor is paired with the scholarly endeavor of uncovering the origins of other people's religions. Just as Europeans had uncovered the origins of their own religion, they would now do this for other people's religion. And that would not only help those people understand why they act the way they do and teach them truth, but it would also be part of this greater European study of the everything, a categorization of all knowledge. <coughs> 